Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Daniel Conroy Bim. He is Assistant Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He uses an evolutionary perspective to understand how mate preferences are linked to actual mating outcomes. Specifically, he is interested in how mate preferences are integrated with one another computationally in order to make mating to make mating decisions. Sorry, his work combines agent-based modeling of mate choice evolution with studies of real couples to compare and explore candidate algorithms for how people select their mating strategies, evaluate mating potential mates, and regulate their relationships. So, Dr. Cornelroy Bim, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Of course, thanks so much for having me. Okay, great. So, uh, I mean, I've already talked about, uh, or I mean, I've already interviewed a lot of evolutionary psychologists on the show, and also on the issue of um, human mate preferences and sex differences in mate preferences and this and that. So, uh, and the evolutionary rationale for the evolution of mate preferences, but. Uh, and I've also had, I, I guess that you also studied under Dr. David Buss, am mm -hmm. I correct? Yeah, I did my PhD with David. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've already had him on the show, but uh, let me just ask you before we get into the specific topics that you study that are very interesting, um, why and how did uh, human mate preferences evolve? I, I mean, what is the evolutionary rationale behind them? Yeah, so uh, it's a good question. Uh, and I think it's one that we sort of forget to ask sometimes. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so first of all, mate choice is quite possibly the most important decision that any sexually reproducing animal will ever make, right? Because mating obviously directly impacts reproduction. Evolution itself is just differential reproduction, and so who you select as a mate has huge consequences for your fitness and huge consequences for evolution. So there's a lot of, uh, there's very strong selection pressures that focus on the mate choice process. Uh, and, you know, part of those selection pressures are going to be focused on the fact that uh, not all mates have uh, equal consequences for your reproductive success, right? So some mates are going to uh, be more beneficial uh, if you are successful in attracting them as a partner, uh, then will others. Uh, and organisms that are sort of blind to that fact uh, are going to be fiercely outcompeted by their partners that are able to identify those that have uh, positive consequences to their reproductive success. Uh, and so what preferences are picking up on uh, are those dimensions of variation, those those aspects that, that determine how beneficial a partner is uh, for an organism's reproductive success. Mm -hmm. And what would you say are perhaps some of the main aspects that men and women have to pay more attention to if they want to be successful uh, reproducing? I mean, what are the kinds of um, psychological, behavioral, and also physical traits of the opposite sex that if someone is to mate with that particular partner, then they would increase their fitness. Sure. Well, I mean, there are there there are lots of things that we know uh, that humans prefer, and they they seem to uh, largely map onto things that would have been beneficial to our ancestors throughout our evolutionary history. So uh, we know from David Buss's work, uh, as well as many many others, right? Uh, the things that top the list pretty consistently. Uh, are things that make sense. So kindness is usually at the top, somebody uh, who's going to be cooperative with you and somebody who's not going to be aggressive toward you. Uh, intelligence, somebody who uh, has good ideas, is a good problem solver. Uh, dependability, someone who's going to actually be there to help you when, when you need it. Um, health, right? somebody who's going to live <laughs> for the duration of your relationship and is also not going to uh, you know, pass on dangerous diseases to you or your offspring. Uh, these are pretty consistently at the top of people's lists. Uh, and then we see following those things, some of the sex differences start to appear. Uh, so for men, uh, men typically more heavily prioritize physical attractiveness uh, and youth uh, relative to women. Uh, and these are things that 
seem to be cues of what's actually somewhat debated now, um, but uh, the major hypotheses historically have been uh, health, fertility, uh, or fecundity really, uh, and reproductive value. Uh, and for women, women typically more prioritize uh, ambition and resources uh, with things that historically would have been uh, cues to uh, offspring provisioning capacity. Mm -hmm. So just to make this clear, because nowadays, and I mean, not just nowadays, but it has always been a bit controversial to talk about sex differences from a biological perspective or with a biological basis. Uh, and I mean, these differences that we're talking about here, they are they occur on average. I mean, there's a lot. Uh, they are usually distributed in the form of bell curves and they superimpose a little bit between the sexes and not only that but I mean it's not genetically or biologically determined right they are permeable to influences of uh, several different sorts like for example environmental influences uh, learning cultural differences ecological factors and things like that right yeah absolutely yeah so these are on average sex differences that we're talking about so uh, there's a lot of within sex variation uh, on every single preference uh, and the exact sources of that variation uh, are not, uh, if you ask me, not super well understood, uh, but you've hit all of the candidates. Uh, uh, you know, learning, I think uh, there's not a lot of work within evolutionary psychology uh, looking at learning and mate preferences, but I think there's a lot of work in non-human animals uh, on learning and mating. And so I think that's definitely uh, a big part of it, how those learning systems work, who knows, but uh, that, that definitely has to be involved. Uh, there are ecological factors that are probably weighing in. Uh, yeah, these are not uh, sort of fixed uh, and, and uh, invariant <laughs> sex differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even, I guess, as far as I know, uh, even in terms of uh, the contexts where men and women prefer short-term or long-term strategies, it also depends on a little bit on the ecological conditions they are exposed to, and then it also connects, at least to some extent, with uh, life history theory, and if people adopt a more fast-paced or slow-paced life history strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, and so, for example, uh, thinking about context and strategy and preferences, uh, Dave Schmidt has a, a nice older paper, older these days, uh, uh, providing evidence that sex ratio, local sex ratio, affects mating strategies uh, in ways that you would expect. Uh, so uh, when men are scarcer, uh, the population shifts more towards a short-term mating strategy, but when men are more numerous, it shifts more towards a long-term mating strategy. Uh, and then uh, this is not published, not even submitted yet, but just a couple months ago, my grad student presented some new data uh, at HBES where she has some evidence that sex ratio does a similar thing with preferences. Uh, so uh, when men are more scarce, they become more selective. Or well, really, it's more when women become more scarce, women become more selective, uh, but less selective when they're more numerous. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I mean, we've been talking about mate preferences, and I guess that at least to some extent, these literature is already well established. But I guess that one particular thing that you've been studying in your work is not uh, specifically what are the mate preferences, but with the mate preferences that we already know about, how people compute them, uh, the kinds of algorithms they use, and how that translates into the mate choices <laughs> that they do. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, like we've been talking about, you're right. Uh, the content of people's preferences is, is fairly well established. We have decades of research looking at what it is people want. Uh, and, you know, the determinants of those, the things that move those things around, we have slight sense of you know we think we know things like sex matter we know things like mating strategy matter um so we have we have a decent handle on those sorts of things but you're right we have very little idea what happens next right so okay take all these things that you say that you prefer when a psychologist asks you uh how do you go out into the real world and look at a potential partner and say you know this is how much i desire that person right given my preferences this is how this is their mate value to me this is how much i would be interested in a relationship with them uh, there's very little work on that, and, and we still don't have a very clear sense of how that's happening. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, b- because I, I mean, of course, we know of all of these mate preferences that are common in men and women, but we still don't know that much, at least as far as I understand it, how people uh, in different contexts rank, order them, and uh, the different weights that they put in each different mate preference, and then how they sort of join them together to make a decision in terms of, uh, okay, so I have these X number of partners available, Uh, how should I decide which one of them would be the best for me to mate with? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, I think uh, for a long time, the sort of default assumption was uh, was it sort of just a it's just a linear combination. So it, it's just uh, having more of a positive thing is good, uh, and the more you prefer that thing, the more good that is. Uh, uh, and people just assume that that must be how it worked, and, and so nobody really thought to look at it. Um, but that's just one possibility, uh, and it's also, I think there are reasons to believe it's not a very good possibility. Um, and there are other possibilities out there. I think so, Peter Todd and Jeffrey Miller uh, proposed this really interesting uh, sequential aspiration idea where uh, what they said is it's not a sort of set of weights and sums, what it is, it's a set of thresholds. Uh, so it's this increasingly sort of stringent set of thresholds that each potential mate has to cross. So first you have to be, you know, let's say this kind uh, and if you're not kind enough, then you're out. And then after that, you have to be this intelligent. And after that, you have to be this funny, whatever. Um, uh, so that's one possible way that it could happen. Um, I've been advocating for this uh, Euclidean approach. This is the hypothesis I've been testing that has worked reasonably well so far within my own data. Uh, which, uh, but you know, there's not a lot of uh, not a lot of hypotheses out there. This is something. It's a question that people have only been asking relatively recently, and there's also even less data. So it, it's still pretty unclear how this is happening. Mm-hmm. And how have you been testing all of those different hypotheses, including the Euclidean algorithm mm-hmm. that you've proposed? Uh, how, how have you tested them and in what contexts? And also, what sort of conclusions have you been arriving at? Sure. So uh, I've tested these things in a, in a few different ways so far. Uh, but the, the main way that I approach these things uh, I try to combine what are called agent-based models uh, with with studies of real mating data. So agent-based models is just a type of computer simulation uh, where you set up a population with a bunch of sort of little autonomous individuals who are called agents uh, who have different behaviors that are governed by different decision rules. Uh, so what I do is I set up uh, uh, agent-based models of different mating markets. Um, and these mating markets are sort of underpinned by different kinds of mate choice algorithms. Uh, so some of them might be that kind of weighted sum approach that, that people assume for a long time. Uh, some of them might be something more like the kind of sequential aspiration uh, idea that Peter Todd proposed. Uh, some of them might be using a, a Euclidean uh, algorithm for integrating their preferences. Uh, and what I do is I just let those mating markets play out. Uh, and I see what kind of relationships emerge in those simulations. Uh, and then I compare those simulations to data from real world couples. And I see which simulated mating markets produce couples that look the most like real world couples. Uh, and, and so far, you know, in a the handful of studies that we've done on this, uh, uh, what consistently comes out as producing sort of the most realistic data uh, is the Euclidean model. Um, Mm-hmm. So, uh, and using that model in, in the studies that you do, you study several different aspects of mating. For example, you study what you call preference fulfillment, uh, self-mate value, partner mate value, ideal mate value. Could you tell us about these different sorts of parameters or things that you study and what each of them is about? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the way the way I'm drawing this conclusion, the way uh, the way I'm saying that what what works the best is this Euclidean approach is uh, when you set up uh, a mating market that's based on Euclidean mate preference integration. Uh, there's a sort of characteristic set uh, or pattern of findings that you typically find within these mating markets. Uh, so, one is uh, the agents will tend to have pretty strong what I've called Euclidean mate preference fulfillment, uh, and that is. Uh, the partners that they wind up with 
uh, will tend to be a short Euclidean distance from their preferences through this kind of abstract multi-dimensional preference space. Uh, so, you know, if you imagine if you have three preferences, let's say for kindness, intelligence, and good health, uh, uh, if those are your three preferences, then you can imagine this sort of abstract three-dimensional cube where sort of one line on the cube is health, another line is kindness, and then another, another line is intelligence. I think those are the three that I said. Um, so in that cube, you can sort of locate where your ideal partner would be uh, anywhere in that space. And then you can also locate where your actual partner is. And you can just draw the straight line distance between those two. Uh, so that distance is the mate value of that partner to you, uh, well, the inverse of that distance. Uh, and so when you're using Euclidean algorithm, what you're doing is calculating your attraction to your potential partners based on that distance. Uh, and what you find is if you set up markets where mate choice works like that, uh, uh, then the agents tend to pair with partners that are a short distance through that you know, three-dimensional cube. Uh, so that's what I mean when I say strong Euclidean mate preferences fulfillment. It means the partners are a short distance from the agent's preferences. Uh, and you tend to see the exact same thing uh, when you look at real human data. When you look at uh, what people actually want uh, and compare that to their actual partners, their partners tend to be a relatively short Euclidean distance from their preferences. Uh, so that's one typical thing that you see, uh, but there are other things. So uh, in particular, uh, when you set up these markets, what you see is uh, that people who are high uh, in what we call overall Euclidean mate value, uh, they tend to have more power of choice uh, on this mating market. Uh, so uh, by overall mating, uh, overall mate value, what we mean is uh, these people are close to the preferences of the opposite sex in general. Uh, the distance between their traits and what the opposite sex wants is short. Uh, and these people uh, basically get better mate choice, right? So uh, they, they set higher standards because they can get away with it. Uh, they get partners who are closer to their preferences because they're more desirable. Uh, and because of the combination of both of those things, they tend to pair with more with higher mate value partners. There's a sorted of mating from mate value. Uh, so all of those three things uh, come out in, in simulations based on Euclidean mate value. And then you see all of those same three things uh, in real world human data. Uh, and you see that in all kinds of samples. You see that in university samples, you see that in internet samples, and we have some new data uh, that says you see that in uh, across cultures, across 45 different countries. Uh, you see that same pattern uh, of Euclidean mate value giving you power of choice in the mating market. Mm -hmm. So uh, is it the case that that type of studies allow for us to make inferences about, for example, if people sort of uh, adjust their mate preferences according to the way they if uh, they they feel them uh, themselves are rank uh, are um, they, I mean uh, uh, how they think about their position in the mm -hmm. rank let's say in the mating in the mate market uh, I, I mean because I guess that for example someone who is rated as a six could try to go for a seven or an, an eight or even a nine but then I, I mean just because people more or less know their own position in the mate market, then they would sort of adjust the partners they would be looking for. And for example, look for a six or a seven at maximum in that case. Do those types of studies allow for us to study that sort of phenomenon or, or not? Yeah, no, absolutely. So that is uh, uh, one of the predictions that comes out of these Euclidean agent-based models. So when you when you set up these agent-based models and you, and you let the, the populations evolve based on these mating markets, uh, one of the things that happens is the agents do uh, tend to calibrate their preferences to their own mate value. So higher mate value agents tend to set higher mate value standards and lower mate value agents tend to set lower mate value standards. Presumably, uh, yeah, in part because uh, if you're a low mate value agent, uh, your odds of attracting a high mate value partner are lower. Uh, and so uh, if you spend all of your time trying to go after these partners that are not going to like you back, uh, you're going to miss out on all the partners who would like you back. Uh, and so you do tend to see this sort of calibration of preferences to own mate value. And then you see the same thing within the human data, uh, that people people's preferences are uh, sort of well tailored to their own mate value. Mm -hmm. So, and it also allows for you to compare, for example, the mate value of the partners people are partnered with uh, currently uh, with their ideal mate, let's say, and then perhaps draw some conclusions in terms 
of relationship satisfaction and if they are more prone to switching mates and things like that, right? Yeah, yeah. So we do have uh, one paper with uh, Carrie Getz and David Boss uh, where we look at exactly this. We look at uh, relationship satisfaction as a function of a variety of these kinds of mate value discrepancies. Uh, so one is the discrepancy between your mate and your ideals. That's that's mate preference fulfillment. Uh, another is the discrepancy in mate value between you and your partner. Uh, and then a third is the discrepancy in mate value between your partner and the other people that you could, in principle, try to partner with. Uh, and what we see is all three seem to affect relationship satisfaction. Uh, so the further your partner is from your ideals, uh, the less satisfied you are, although that one's kind of the least clear, maybe. Um, uh, the higher in mate value your partner is compared to you, the more satisfied you tend to be. Uh, and the higher in mate value your partner is compared to your alternatives, the higher uh, your satisfaction tends to be. Uh, and then interestingly, we didn't predict this, but we, what we found and what we've replicated uh, a few times now uh, is there's an interaction between some of these mate value discrepancies uh, where uh, basically uh, the, discrep the interaction is between uh, the discrepancy between you and your partner and the discrepancy between your partner and your alternatives. Uh, and what happens is if your partner is higher in mate value than you, uh, you care a lot less about your alternatives. You're just happy. Like if you got a higher mate value partner, you lucked out, you're not going to rock the boat, you're, you're satisfied. Uh, but if your partner is lower in mate value than you, that's when you start to care about your alternatives, right? So if there are a lot of all, if your partner is lower mate value than, me, than you, and there are a lot of alternatives, that's when you get dissatisfied. But if your partner is lower mate value than you, but there aren't a lot of good alternatives, you're still satisfied, right? Because even though they're lower mate value than you, you still got the best option for you out there. Mm -hmm. And apart from the mate value of your partner and the people and the potential partners around you, uh, are there other factors that people also take into account and compute when they're deciding if we if it would be beneficial for them to thinking about switching partners or not? Absolutely. Um, but what are they? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think. Uh, uh, you know, we in evolutionary psychology have been so focused on understanding mate choice, uh, I think for very good reason, uh, but we've been so laser focused on on just getting into the relationship uh, that we don't really have a great sense of what happens once you're already in it. Uh, and so uh, I don't think there is a, a really clear sort of adaptationist theory of relationship satisfaction uh, that, that makes a lot of predictions. Um, and I think that's that's work that we really need, and it's work that my lab uh, is hopefully going to start do, uh, going to be starting pretty soon. Um, but yeah, it, we've studied uh, jealousy, I guess, a fair amount. Um, but we sort of left all of the other relationship emotions on the table, <laughs> uh, and so there's not a super clear understanding of what what all is affecting relationship satisfaction beyond the value discrepancies. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but I mean, when people are evaluating the partner they are together with uh, at the moment and other people around them and they are sort of deciding if it would be more beneficial for them to continue the relationship or trying to switch with another person. Uh, I, I, I mean, um, I guess that the question I want to ask is, so the, uh, people, there are different sorts of dynamics occurring here in the sense that people maybe when they are alone and trying to choose a new partner, let's say, maybe they take some information into account, but then as the relationship progresses, maybe there might be some changes occurring there and it could be the case that the partner for some reason or another uh, loses mate value like for example um, in the case of women i guess they they over time they could lose some uh, physical traits that are associated with attractiveness for men in the case of men they could lose their job their job or, or or their earning earning capacity or something <laughs> like that so i mean as the relationship progresses people also look into those aspects and how the mate value of their partners might change over time, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, you know, uh, 
like I said, we've been sort of laser focused on on mate choice. I think we've also been kind of laser focused on initial mate choice. I think we usually think about these things in the context of sort of unmated people looking for a partner. Uh, and we don't often, uh, that happens, right? That's a thing, that's a thing that's worth studying. But, uh, you know, most people choose more than one partner within their lifetimes, right? It, it's probably only once that you uh, are uh, totally single, totally detached and choose a partner. Uh, it's usually within the context of some ongoing or some failed relationship. And, and we don't really think about uh, uh, how that might play into mate choice. Uh, so, you know, I had a paper with David Buss and a few others on this sort of mate switching idea, uh, where I think for most of human evolution, yeah, most of mate choice was probably happening in the context of some kind of recent slash ongoing relationship. Uh, and how those sorts of factors weigh into mate choice is something that we haven't really considered. Uh, but the, yeah, there are probably uh, lots of other considerations uh, that come into play once you've already chosen a mate and are now thinking about choosing a new mate. So one is, uh, if you're still in the relationship, right, what are the costs of remaining in this relationship versus the cost of trying to switch? Uh, what's the probability if you left this relationship that you would actually uh, be able to find and attract uh, a partner who's at least as good as this one and hopefully better? Um, what are the costs that are going to come from dissolving this relationship, right? Are there going to be uh, reputational damages? Uh, are there going to be uh, angry in-laws? Uh, is this going to affect your your social network, right? Are you going to lose friends over this? Uh, so there are, there are a lot of factors that start to come in that uh, are in addition to your mate preferences uh, that we surely have adaptations that are tracking, uh, but we just don't have uh, don't have data on them. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I also asked you about that because I guess that this sort of literature also connects with the literature on mate retention tactics. And I guess, I mean, I'm just speculating a little bit now, but I guess I would imagine that a, a lower quality mate, let's say, if his partner with a higher quality mate than the lower quality mate. I mean, it would make sense for him to employ some mate retention tactics just for not let the other partner that is really high value uh, leave the relationship. And then some of those mate retention tactics, some of the time might impose co uh, some sort of cost on the other per person, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so there are a variety of mate retention tactics uh, that we have evidence that people use, uh, some of which are uh, sort of benefit bestowing. So try to entice your partner to stay within this relationship. So, you know, be extra nice to them, do more than your share of household chores. I think that's a literal item on the mate retention inventory. Uh, but then some of them are cost inflicting, right? So uh, rather than enticing a partner to stay, you sort of increase the cost of them leaving. Uh, and so these are things like, you know, all of the sort of classic symptoms of jealousy, right? So, so keeping extra tabs on them, being extra possessive on them, not letting them, not letting them see potential rivals, uh, uh, and these, you know, could work uh, if you are successful in increasing the cost of leaving large enough. They could work in keeping a partner around. But you're right; they also they are adding cost to your partner. Uh, and if your partner is already consider considering leaving this relationship and you add additional costs on top of it, it might be just the tipping point that pushes them away. So these things can backfire. Mm -hmm. And some of these things might even connect with um, domestic violence, for example. Uh, I would imagine that in some cases, I'm not sure if there's some literature on that, but in some cases, some men might, for example, be, be violent toward their female partners because uh, in some circumstances that would decrease their mate value because uh, uh, it would decrease their attractiveness in the sense that they would be beaten up and uh, I mean, some of their beauty traits, let's say, would decrease, I guess. So, uh, I mean, this is more David's area than mine, uh, but uh, you're right. So there are strong links between jealousy uh, and domestic violence. And I do think suspicion of infidelity is is one uh, major predictor of, of intimate partner violence. Uh, and it's it's a common hypothesis, an old hypothesis, that that uh, intimate partner violence is just sort of a, an extreme form of mate retention. Uh, maybe functional, maybe not. Maybe it's just sort of mate retention mechanisms gone haywire. Um, uh, and I think that's one possibility. I'm, 
uh, for what it's worth, I'm a bit skeptical of that. I think uh, cost inflicting mate retention in general sort of seems like an odd strategy to me. You have a partner who's already considering leaving, and so your strategy is to add extra costs to being in a relationship with you. Uh, so I'm not I'm not positive that it, these, all of these cost inflicting uh, behaviors are necessarily mate retention. Uh, one thing I wonder is if they're more uh, if they're more an expression of anger. It's more uh, you're inflicting costs on them because you know you've evaluated that they don't value you enough, uh, and so it's this is more handled by the anger system than by the jealousy system. But uh, you know we just don't know. That's just my conjecture. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so le let me ask you now about a specific paper that you published, that I, I, I guess that I have the correct title, that is How Sexually Dimorphic Are Human Mate Preferences? Because mm -hmm. we were just talking about that earlier in the interview. And I, I mean, it's interesting because uh, people who sort of deny uh, biological basis for mate preferences, particularly in humans, uh, many times they say that, okay, so you can't predict, for example, that someone is a man or a woman just, just on the basis of one single type of mate preference or one variable. But uh, in this paper, you approach things talking about multivariate analysis, and I guess that as you add up uh, multiple variables, then the probability of correctly identifying some someone as a man or a woman increases drastically, and sometimes it almost reaches 100%. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I, there's there's been a lot of interest in sex differences. There's been a ton of debate on sex differences, you know, in lots of things, the preferences included for, for decades and decades. Uh, the point of that paper, though, is that most of this work, uh, sort of, like you said, it focuses on one sex difference at a time. So what's the sex difference in preference for physical attractiveness? What's the sex difference in preference of resources? What's the sex difference in preference for age? Whatever. Um, and, you know, these exist. They're cross-culturally universal. They're pretty robust. Um, but, yeah, people argue eh, each one is kind of small on its own, so what does it really matter? Uh, but the point here was, uh, and the point in a lot of my work is, you know, mate selection is highly multidimensional, right? We don't, we don't ever select our partners based on just one preference. We select our partners based on a whole complex of preferences. Uh, and if all of if a whole complex of preferences, if each one has a slight difference, then yeah, that will add up to being a major, you know, pretty categorical difference overall. Uh, and so again, if you imagine that kind of abstract uh, preference space, that you know, n-dimensional hypercube that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, you know, the the difference between men and women on one dimension might be kind of small, but then you have another difference on another dimension and another difference on another dimension. The distance between men and women through that space. Uh, can grow pretty rapidly, uh, even if the difference on each dimension is relatively slight. Uh, and yeah, in that paper we found with the, I forget exactly how many references we used in that paper off the top of my head, uh, 16 or so, uh, most of which, uh, I think even with just the the six or so that were sex differentiated, yeah, you can get over 80% accuracy uh, in predicting someone's sex just by knowing their preferences, which is, you know, that's a pretty remarkable <laughs> approaching categorical difference. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have the number of variables that you took into account here, but I have a small uh, quote here that, where you say sex differences are large in multivariate terms, yielding an overall D of 2.41, corresponding to overall between, uh, to overlap, sorry, between the sexes of just 22.8%. Moreover, knowledge of mate preferences alone affords correct classification of sex with 92.2% accuracy. So I guess that this was the value I was referring to mm -hmm. when I said that if you compute all of the different uh, mate preferences, at least the ones you took into account in this study, you get pretty close to 100% accuracy in identifying someone uh, as being a man or a woman. Yeah, yeah. And I, in fact, uh, you know, I did that paper. I was like a third year grad student when I wrote that paper. I still didn't know a lot. I think I could probably get higher than 92%. I think there are some more powerful classifiers that I've learned about since then that would probably do a better job with that data.
Nice. <laughs> okay, so uh, now moving on to, uh, I guess, a completely different topic, even though it's somewhat related, because, I, I mean, another very interesting thing uh, to study in evolutionary psychology and in terms of how humans establish interpersonal relationships has to do with friendship. I mean, last year I've had on the show Dr. April Blasky Ricek, who has done some work uh, on this topic. Uh, and I mean, but still, uh, there's a thing that bothers me a bit that is the conflict that might arise, particularly in opposite sex friendships, because it seems to me, and I read a paper of yours, I, I don't remember if you were the main author or a co author, but uh, on this topic, and it seems that um, the um, the way by which people uh, select their opposite sex friends, uh, I mean, it follows along more or, le more or less mate preferences for men and women in the opposite sex. And so I guess that could uh, very easily turn into some sort of conflict if one of the Pers one of the people there uh, is interested in starting a romantic relationship and the other isn't because I, I mean it uh, it attracts the mate preferences so I, I guess that you understand what I'm trying to say here right yeah yeah so one you know I, I know April's work I really love her work on friendship she, she's done a lot of really cool stuff uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but you're right that was the paper I wasn't the main author on that in fact I worked on that uh, back when I was an undergrad, um, but it was sort of inspired in part by April's work, uh, and we were sort of surprised that there wasn't a ton of work on friend preferences. Uh, friendship in general is is a really neglected topic, right? It's it's one of the most important social relationships that we form, that people form around the world, and and have for all of recorded history. Uh, but we don't have a, a super great sense uh, uh, of the adaptations involved in friendship. Uh, and so that's something that, that needs rectifying. Um, uh, but so, yeah, we were just trying to take a first stab at, at, at preferences and in particular comparing uh, same sex and opposite sex friendships. Uh, and because there was uh, a lot of, a, hand, a bit of work out there, uh, including from people like April, uh, that seemed to suggest that uh, uh, opposite sex friendships might be sort of related to mateships. Uh, and this is especially so, especially so for men. Uh, so uh, men uh, tend to report more than women uh, being attracted to their opposite sex friends, uh, considering their opposite sex friends as potential partners, uh, and you know men, uh, or well at least depending on how you look at this, I think it's women tend to report sort of attraction being more of a problem with their opposite sex friends than men do. Uh, uh, so men seem to be more interested in their opposite sex friends as mates than women are. Uh, and indeed, yeah, when you look at um, when you look at people's preferences, uh, you ask people what they want in a same-sex friend uh, and also what they want in an opposite-sex friend. Uh, uh, at the time, we used a, a budget allocation paradigm, so people, people were sort of allocating a limited budget of friend dollars to, uh, I think, 10 different traits that they wanted in a potential friend or something like that. Uh, and what you find is if you look at same-sex friends, uh, what people want is pretty sensible, right? They want somebody who's friendly and with good social skills and, uh, 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 you know, supportive and healthy, whatever. Um, but if you look at opposite sex friends, uh, what you see is women's preferences don't change all that much. Uh, women want more or less the same thing uh, in an opposite sex friend that they do in a same sex friend, but men's preferences change quite a bit. Uh, and men's preferences for an opposite sex friend look suspiciously like their preferences in a potential mate, right? So uh, a much higher uh, valuation of physical attractiveness in an opposite sex friend than in a same sex friend, much lower valuation of things like uh, physical prowess. Uh, so it does seem like uh, in terms of what men are looking for in a friend, uh, they're sort of setting themselves up <laughs> for, for those attraction problems because they're looking for things that are very much what, what they want in a mate. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I guess that's interesting also because it raises some questions about uh, why people choose the friends that they choose, right? Because, for example, in the case of women and since 
they usually require a lot of investment from the people they establish relationships with, particularly romantic relationships. But I, I mean, couldn't it be the case that at least in some circumstances or in some situations, women might establish friendships with men to get the sorts of investment they want from those men without having having to commit to a full-fledged, let's say, romantic relationship where they would also have to provide men with, for example, access to sex and things like that? Uh, it's certainly possible. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think... Uh, if you ask women, I don't think they perceive that that's what they're doing. Uh, I think uh, they perceive that, you know, they, these are friendships on par with their same-sex friendships. Uh, and all friendships are, you know, cooperative relationships that which are ways to get valuable support and resources. Uh, uh, but it, it is also possible that these are sort of, you know, maybe trial mating periods, right? So uh, if the men are already sort of thinking about this as a potential romantic relationship, then it can be a sort of way of maybe sussing out potential mates uh, and a lot of mateships do start as friendships uh, so you know maybe uh, even though women don't report it uh, or aren't aware of it uh, maybe uh, yeah there is a lot more mating motivation in women's opposite sex friendships than uh, than they tend to say Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's also that literature on, um, I guess I would call it uh, plan B potential partners or something mm -hmm. like that. That is yep. that even, even when women are in established romantic relationships, they at least some of the time keep male friends with them that uh, they consider... Uh, a plan B if that relationship fails for one reason or another, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and this is something that's been hypothesized for, for both men and women to do, to keep these sort of backup mates around uh, just in case. I mean, this is sort of related to, to mate switching that we were talking about earlier. Uh, to keep sort of cultivate backup mates, uh, people that, that uh, uh, would be good potential partners if something went wrong with your current relationship. Uh, and yeah, opposite sex friends are, are probably a pretty good candidate for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I guess that uh, there's still a lot of things that we don't really know uh, or don't know that well about uh, human mate, mate preferences and also how humans establish uh, romantic relationships and how they compute the several different mate preferences and also in their particular social context and so on and so forth. So, uh, I, I mean, from all of the things that we still don't know about, what would you say are some of the most interesting mysteries about human mating that you would like to see answered in the following years, let's say? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, I think it's actually a really exciting time to be in human mating. I think there's there's a lot of really interesting questions that have kind of cracked open in the last couple of years. Uh, I remember being, you know, a junior graduate student and, and very, very naively thinking that, you know, all the interesting questions in mating have already been answered. We're just kind of working on the fringes now. Uh, and I think, God, how dumb was I? Um, uh, I think, uh, in particular, the sort of broader replication crisis within psychology uh, has, has, you know, caused us to question a lot of the things that we thought were relatively certain uh, and, and has opened up the field for asking a lot of really new and interesting questions. Uh, so I think, you know, one, one obvious area is, uh, you know, hormones uh, and human mating. I think, uh, uh, our perspective uh, on the relationship between hormones and mating uh, was sort of dominated by a kind of couple of key hypotheses and a handful of sort of key papers. Um, but I think now we're realizing post replication crisis that a lot of that work, uh, you know, relied on on heavily underpowered, uh, very small samples uh, and, you know, pretty noisy suboptimal methods. Uh, uh, and so a lot of the the findings are not the most stable, uh, and so a lot of the uh, a lot of the hypotheses that those findings supported are, are now being called into question. And so there's um, lots of really cool work going on uh, in hormones and human mating. Uh, I believe you just had Lars Penka uh, 
uh, on your show, and, and he's doing some really cool work uh, on ovulation and human mating. Uh, my own colleague, Jim Roney, uh, has been doing really great work uh, on hormones for a really long time uh, and has had some uh, really interesting theories uh, about the functions of physiological systems uh, involved in mating that I think now are getting more serious attention uh, as we realize some of the older ideas aren't holding up. So I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting work in the next couple of years uh, looking at, at what exactly hormones are doing uh, in the context of human mating. Um, I also think uh, mating strategy, uh, I think, is something that's going to get uh, some more interesting attention uh, within the next several years. I think uh, Bustin Schmidt, uh, 1993, did a really great idea, uh, great job of introducing this idea of a short-term and long-term mating continuum. Um, but it, it's not very precise. Uh, it was sort of the initial idea of mating strategy, but nobody has really gone back uh, and filled in a lot of the details. Uh, you know, what exactly is varying along this continuum? Is it time? Is it investment? Uh, you know, how do you know uh, what sort of relationships fall on what parts of that continuum? How do you know if you're in a short-term or long-term relationship? Uh, what exactly are the computations going on in the head that govern these kinds of things? Uh, uh, we don't have good answers for a lot of those things. And I think people are, are starting to realize that. And, and I think there's going to be some interesting stuff there. Um, you mentioned life history theory. Uh, life history theory has just exploded <laughs> in popularity. It's really amazing. I, you know, I was just at HBES uh, a couple months ago, and I noticed, you know, looking at the program, there are a lot of sessions, you know, that five years ago would have been named Mating 4, Mating 5, Mating 6, that are now Life History 2, Life History 3. Um, there's a lot of cool work going on in that area, but I think there's also uh, some very interesting sort of controversies brewing there, too. Um, you know, I think Dan Nettle, who you've also interviewed, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, had an interesting paper um, uh, using bibliometric analyses showing that the sort of the psychologist's conception of life history theory has distanced from the biologist's conception of life history theory. Uh, and so it's going to be interesting to see where psychologists go with life history theory, but it's also going to be interesting to see whether those can be connected again uh, uh, or whether they need to be connected again. Um, uh, and then also, you know, Brendan Zeech, I think, had, a, had an interesting new paper uh, sort of critiquing uh, the sort of within species approach to life history theory. Uh, so I think there's going to be some nice debates uh, in that area. And then, of course, you know, I'm biased, but <laughs> my own area, uh, you know, we, we've done a good job kind of mapping the content of preferences, I would say, uh, but, but a very poor job understanding, you know, how computationally do you get from those abstract ideals to concrete evaluations? Uh, that's where most of my work has been, and, and we still don't have a stellar understanding of how that's happening. But then even worse, <laughs> we have even less understanding of, well, how do you go from those evaluations to actually choosing a partner, right? How do you go into this complicated dynamic mating market where there's no perfect partner, you have to outcompete rivals, you have to, you know, not only pick a partner, but they've got to pick you back. Right. What's the set of decision rules that people are using to navigate those circumstances? Uh, I think we have very poor understanding of that, and that's something that, that my lab is going to be tackling, uh, you know, first and foremost over the next five years or so. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't you agree? I, I mean, you referred to several different things le there. Let me just unpack a little bit. Sure. Uh, don't, don't you agree that, uh, I, I mean, perhaps uh, one of the flaws in evolutionary psychology and I love evolutionary psychology, of course, because I've already had quite a lot of evolutionary psychologists on the show. But one of its flaws, maybe, is that in, it focuses too much. Of, of course, that's one of the tenets of the discipline, but it perhaps focuses too much uh, on the ultimate side of things in terms of explaining perhaps the ph phylogenetic basis of the mental mechanisms that people are studying there and also uh, the sort of uh, evolutionarily relevant problems that they have evolved to solve. And I, I mean, on the proximate side, I know that people also study how the mechanism operates, the sort of inputs of information that it processes and the, also the outputs that usually it gives when people are exposed to different sorts of information and things like that. But I mean, then if you look into, for example, Nico Tinbergen's four questions, there's still one very relevant one there that has to do 
with development and how the trait develops over time, particularly in children, let's say, because when we're talking about the developmental period in humans, we usually think about children and adolescents as well, B because I guess that um, focusing on the developmental side of things would give us very good insights into um, the sort of, let's say, environmental factors that play a role in how the trait develops uh, in different people also. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, ontogeny uh, Tinvergen's ontogeny level, yeah, has been grossly neglected within evolutionary psychology uh, for for quite a long time, and and in no area more than in human mating, we have very very little understanding about the development of a lot of our mating psychology, uh, and you know some of the work in life history theory starts to kind of fill in these gaps. I think like you're hinting, so uh, a lot of the stuff that descends from the sort of psychosocial acceleration idea. Uh, things like father absence and early environmental harshness seems to kind of, by hypothesis, right, track people towards this faster, uh, you know, more short-term mating-oriented mating psychology, uh, and that's that's been really valuable. Um, and like I said before, uh, you know, I think um, uh, there's a lot of room to incorporate an understanding of learning mechanisms within human mating, which uh, would fall within that ontogeny domain. There's been a little bit of work on, on mate choice copying within humans, which is uh, this phenomenon where you uh, basically learn who to find attractive by observing who other people find attractive. So if we notice somebody getting chosen as a mate, we also prefer that person more than if we notice them, or if we don't notice them getting chosen as a mate. Uh, there's lots and lots of research on that in non-human animals, but just a little bit in humans and just a little bit of evidence that happens with us. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's definitely a lot of room uh, for uh, for studying the development of human mating psychology, although it's also, you know, understandably difficult. I think uh, it would be hard to to get an IRB to approve a study on mating in children. <laughs> uh, uh, but there, you know, the, I think there's hope. I think uh, there's been over the last several years a sort of increasing conversation between uh, developmentalists and evolutionary psychologists, uh, and there are a lot of people doing really interesting work. Uh, at the intersection of those things. So I think, uh, you know, my colleague Zoe Liberman, she's not uh, an evolutionary psychologist per se, but she has been doing really fascinating work uh, looking at uh, the development of children's social reasoning, how children sort of understand uh, social structures from, from uh, uh, different sort of simple cues, uh, which is very consistent with an evolutionary perspective. And then you also see people like Annie Wartz doing really interesting work on on children's reasoning about plants uh, from very, very early age. Children have very uh, sensible and sophisticated psychology for, for navigating potential danger, potentially dangerous plant life. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, the future looks good there. We haven't done a very good job uh, feeling in that ontogeny level, but I, I think that's gonna get more popular. Mm -hmm. And then since you refer to the replication crisis, perhaps another big problem that, I mean, is not specific of evolutionary psychology, it's about psychology in general, has to do with uh, people's focusing mostly on weird populations, because I guess that the cross-cultural evidence, and for example, in uh, here in our interview, we talked about one study that you did where you studied, I guess that it was 30 something different uh, samples of different cultures, right, to understand if they really follow the Euclidean algorithm. And <clears throat> I guess that's very valuable also because if in evolutionary psychology we're trying to understand what are the universal mechanisms that we've evolved, and then when we are exposed to different ecological circumstances, then that's one of the reasons why people vary, but uh, the underlying mechanisms themselves, and if they are really uh, universe, human universals or not, then we really have to make an effort, or researchers have to make an effort to try to include more, at least non-weird samples in their studies, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I think evolutionary psychologists uh, among psychologists have always been relatively more interested in these sort of broad cross-cultural cross perspective. 
uh, and you know have, have done more of this work more often uh, and have also you know among psychologists who probably have the most engagement with anthropologists who are doing this work you know out in the field with truly non-weird cultures um, uh, but I do think uh, yeah I mean two major things so one is the yeah Joe Henrik's weird paper uh, I think it's kind of caused all of psychology uh, to get more interested in looking at non non weird uh, societies, and then I also think the replication crisis. I think um, uh, you know pushing people towards larger samples, more open science, more collaboration uh, has just also you know that has made doing large scale cross cultural research make more sense. Uh, and you know uh, I don't have hard numbers on this, but it is my you know at least perception. That, that people are taking this pretty seriously and that, that cross-cultural research, uh, at least you know, on a smaller scale, not on the scale of you know, the 37 culture study, um, but at least you know, incorporating you know, one or a couple uh, uh, different samples from different cultures, I think is becoming more common. Uh, and in fact, you know, in my own work, I think I'm probably involved in more projects that involve a cross-cultural component right now than projects that don't uh, just because people are highly interested in doing that right now. Uh, and it's been really good for the field. Yeah, I mean, we get more representative samples, we get larger samples, uh, there's more collaboration between people around the world, which kind of, you know, helps bring the field together a little bit more. Uh, so yeah, I think there's there's going to be more of that. And it's only it's only really, really good for the science. Right. And uh, just another thing before we go, since you referred earlier to hormones and behavior, I guess that another thing that really can make psychology into a robust scientific discipline is the fact that people can integrate um, evidence from different sources. For example, when we're studying a specific behavior, we can try to understand its uh, phylogenetic history. We can try to understand what are its uh, neuroscientific bases. That is, um, for example, the areas of the brain that light up when that uh, when that mechanism is being used uh, or put into use. Uh, and we can also understand some. Okay, that's a little bit harder, but we can also get that the genetics that underlie that specific mechanism we can understand the neuro endocrinology of it and then uh, as well we can study the developmental aspects of it we can get cross-cultural evidence and evidence from modern and more traditional societies and things like that and uh, i mean it's by integrating all of those different sources of evidence and all of this information that we can really get a solid grasp of how human psychology works and if really what we are talking about exists or or not right yeah yeah i think um you know we have some some uh real theoretical commitments uh as modern psychologists and as modern evolutionary psychologists that uh we often don't take as seriously as we should uh and i i you know it seems like those things are changing so yeah one is uh, we believe all of this psychology stuff that we're talking about is instantiated physically somehow uh, in the physiology, in, in neurons and hormones. Uh, and yeah, we, we if we want to have a complete description of our phenomena, then yeah, we need to do a better job uh, of integrating that information. Uh, and I think people have tried for a long time, but it's been, you know, sort of stymied by this or that. Uh, but I, I think uh, with the replication crisis, uh, I think it's sort of opening up the field to try some new approaches, both theoretically and methodologically. And I think uh, there's going to be a lot of really good progress there in sort of better integrating uh, an understanding of the neurophysiology with our, our understanding of the evolved psychology. And then also, you know, selfishly, we also think uh, what the psychology is doing is it's a set of information processing systems <laughs> that are, you know, capturing information and doing something with that computationally. Uh, and we've kind of had that commitment in the back of our heads for a long time, but we haven't always taken it very seriously in trying to actually map the computations that the psychology is performing. Uh, and, and again, I think that's becoming uh, more of a popular enterprise. Uh, and so I think you know we're going to see more of this sort of description of psychology across multiple levels, from the sort of wet lab neuroscience to the kind of abstract computational formal modeling level. Uh, and and 
there's going to be a lot of progress in both of those areas, I think, uh, in the next few years, and that's going to lead to a much more complete picture of the psychologies we're talking about. Okay, so let's end on that note. And Dr. Conroy Bim, just before we go, would you like to tell people what would be some of the best places on the internet for them to learn a little bit more about your work? Absolutely. So you can find uh, all of my papers, uh, as well as some descriptions of my work and, and my lab uh, on my website. It's just danconroybeam.com. Uh, uh, you can also look me up on Google Scholar uh, or the psych department website uh, for UCSB. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I will be leaving links to all of that and the rest of your work in the description box of the interview. So, and Dr. Conroy Bim, thank you a lot again for taking the time to come on the show and it was really a pleasure to talk to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Hi everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you don't like Patreon, you also have the alternatives of Subscribestar and PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Santel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Gondriano, Jane Eninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Doctors Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, and Bo Weingard, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.